Okay, I'm going live. Here we are. This is uh, part 62 of our verse-by-verse -verse teaching through the entire Gospel of Mark. And let me give you guys a little intro into what we're getting into today. Um, sometimes skeptics, and when I, I don't mean to use that word like as, it's a, as if it were an insult, but I'm trying to just sort of use a term to collectively describe people who approach the Bible with that that view of skepticism, right? Um, they don't believe it. <laughs> That's the idea. Not just skeptical in nature. I think I'm that way, but rather they've concluded they don't believe it. Well, some of the skeptics have uh, sometimes suggested that a lot of the Christians' beliefs, a lot of the beliefs that you and I have right now, that these beliefs weren't really original to Christ or the apostles initially, that they kind of developed later over time. This might seem like inconsequential to someone who's not a Christian, but to a Christian, that's kind of a big deal to think that, you know, the core of my faith is is not authentic with Christ, is not starting with the disciples. That's a problem, you know, for me, because the whole idea is that we're believing what they gave us, the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. So one of the ways that some skeptics, some, will make this case is they'll say that in the Gospel of Mark, we have what they call a low Christology, as opposed to a high Christology. And the idea is that in Mark's gospel, we have Jesus as like um, an important figure, a, a Messiah figure, probably, maybe, um, depending on which skeptic you talk to. And although it's hard to understand how they can argue that, but they'll, they'll also suggest that we don't have Jesus as the exalted, like, you know, the ultimate divine one. Jesus isn't God with us. That that kind of Christology is not there and present in the Gospel of Mark. Now, let me give you guys the background. Forgive the long introduction as we dig into what actually is going to be Jesus standing before the high priest. But this is like a, a, a theological climax of the Gospel of Mark, this important moment, and it addresses the concerns that skeptics have. So, uh, one of the reasons why they target the Gospel of Mark for this is because most scholars will think that Mark was written first. That between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Mark was written first, John was written last. And so some of them, and I only say some, some skeptics, even some scholars, will try to like trace this like development of theology from Mark to John. Now it's one thing to say that the church progressively understood the theology of who Christ was you know, in, in its infancy, that, that they were discovering still in the book of Acts, they're still learning these things. But it's something else to say the apostles didn't originally teach it or that Jesus himself didn't under, have his own understanding that he was the son of God, that he was God with us. That's a problem. So we're going to talk about this because Mark, the earliest of the gospels, does actually have quite a high Christology. It's just, you have to study for it. You have to think about it. Um, Mark, the gospel of Mark does not reward the lazy. <laughs> and so the other claim that skeptics will sometimes make is that there's an underdeveloped concept of Christ's death as our sin offering in the early gospels. And in fact, they'll say it's throughout the entire new Testament. They'll say it's this underdeveloped mm -hmm. idea that the, the idea that Jesus dies for your sin, that, that your sin is actually the thing he's being punished for on the cross, that concept, this atonement idea. Um, that it's not really present there early on. But in fact, not only are both of these things present, they're central, central to the theology that the Gospel of Mark teaches us. And it's one of the reasons why I picked the Gospel of Mark to do this verse by verse study. Because I want to cover and tackle like what skeptics say. Not because I'm angry, but because I like care about them and the people hearing them. And I think that the Bible does withstand scrutiny. So let's scrutinize. All right, so... Let's look at the illegal trial of Jesus. Mark chapter 15, we're going to start in uh, chapter 14, starting in verse 53. We're going to read straight through to verse 72. This is a large portion of scripture. If this is your first time clicking uh, on one of my videos, I'm Pastor Mike Winger, and I do theology, apologetics. Uh, I want to learn, help people learn to think biblically about everything. About half my video content is verse by verse Bible studies, maybe a little less than that. Um, the other the rest of it's Q and A's on Fridays. I do Q and A's at 1 PM and then, um, occasionally do other random videos. Like hopefully this week, Wednesday, hopefully I'll have a new video out on the passion translation, but here we are. Mark 14, 53. Let's just read through it. Just load the whole passage in your mind. Don't worry about what I think about it. You just listen and think about what's happening here. Start asking questions about it. Start making observations on your own. They led Jesus away to the high priest and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes gathered together. Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he was sitting with the officers and warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priest's whole council kept trying to obtain testimony against Jesus to put him to death, and they were not finding any. For many were giving false testimony against him, but their testimony was not consistent. 
Some stood up and began to give false testimony against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and in three days I will build another made without hands. Not even in this respect was their testimony consistent. The high priest stood up and came forward questioned and questioned Jesus, saying, Do you not answer? What is it that these men are testifying against you? But he kept silent and did not answer. Again, the high priest was questioning him and saying to him, Are you the Christ? the son of the blessed one. And Jesus said, I am. And you shall see the son of man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Tearing his clothes, the high priest said, what further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. How does it seem to you? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. Some began to spit at him and to blindfold him and to beat him with their fists and to say to him, prophesy. And the officers received him with slaps in the face. As Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. And seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also are with Jesus the Nazarene. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you're talking about. And he went out onto the porch. The servant girl saw him and began once more to say to the bystanders, This is one of them. But again, he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders were again saying to Peter, surely you are one of them for you are a Galilean too. But he began to curse and swear. I do not know this man you are talking about. Immediately, a rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had made the remark to him. Before a rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he began to weep. All right, this passage... um, comes here right at the very at the very last moments, right? Jesus is is being brought in the middle of the night. He's been betrayed by Judas. He was at, at the Garden of Gethsemane, right? In the middle of the night, he's betrayed by Judas. He's brought at nighttime to have a trial before the Jewish leadership of of Israel and uh, in Jerusalem in particular. And so they go, they put him on trial. They want to, they want to find a reason to kill him, okay? To try to get him killed, and this is their chance. Um, verse fifty three, backing up again to verse 53, and it is, I don't know if you noticed some of it, but there's very high Christology in here, and it's very connected to Jesus's atoning sacrifice. These two things of, you know, that Jesus is God with us and that he is the one who dies for our sin, um, being punished for our sin, they're in this passage, and we'll, we'll get there. But I want you to understand everything, which is why it's going to be a long study today. <laughs> and so um, Mark 15, 14, 53, they led Jesus away to the high priest, and all the chief priests And the elders and the scribes gathered together. This gathering, this council, as it's called in verse 55, is the Sanhedrin. I've used this term before. The Sanhedrin is like the Jewish Supreme Court of the time. Now, they're a limited Supreme Court because the Romans are really in control and they limit the power of the Jewish Sanhedrin. But the Sanhedrin serves a special function. Not only are they there to handle lesser issues, issues amongst just the Jews, they don't have the authority to deal with, you know, non-Jews and stuff, but they can handle lesser issues amongst their own people. But they're really there, right? The Romans have them there to give the appearance of self-government to the Jewish people so they won't rebel against the Romans. So the Sanhedrin is, you know, they, they sort of have two tasks. One is for the benefit of the Jewish people, and the other one is for the benefit of the Romans and their control. And we'll see how this plays into Jesus's execution because they have some influence in getting Jesus, a lot of influence in Jesus, getting Jesus crucified under Pontius Pilate because of their role trying to keep the peace. Um, they can reverse that role real quick and cause problems. Uh, one of the problems with this with this whole idea, though, he goes before the Sanhedrin. This, this is literally a court case, basically. Effectively, it's like a court case. He's, he's, a, he's in front of the Supreme Court. The terms that are used there, the chief priests, elders, and scribes, is a threefold term to describe the Sanhedrin. Uh, this, again, is evidence that Mark knows the history. Mark, The Gospel of Mark does know and is familiar with what's going on in the, in the time of Jesus, right there in Palestine or in Israel. Um, I'm not trying to give a political commentary here. <laughs> and forgive me for whatever terms I use there. But um, but the idea here is that it, it it's like a court case, but it's got issues. It happens at night. Um, that already is a problem, okay? Like, just think for a second. If you were dragged into court at 3 a.m. and the leaders of the court are all gathered together at 3 a.m. to hear your case, you already know something's not right. This is sketchy. 
this is a very sketchy trial. This whole trial's is got issues. Now, in the Mishnah, the Jewish Mishnah, which is written about 200 years after Jesus' time, we have a record of what the rules are for capital trials that the Sanhedrin will hold when they want to condemn someone to death. They have to have them during the daytime. They cannot happen at night. They cannot happen on the eve of a festival. Jesus here is it's on the eve of Passover when they do this trial. They must be held at one of three courtrooms, but Jesus is not being brought to a courtroom. He's being brought to the high priest's house in the middle of the night here. And it must begin by hearing a case for the defense, but no case is offered in defense of Jesus by anybody. They don't even try to. And there's not allowed to there's not allowed to be a verdict that day. Because it's such a heavy thing to give the death penalty, they can't give a verdict that day. They're supposed to wait 24 hours before giving the verdict, let like marinate and consider the testimony they've heard and all that. None of these things are observed in Jesus' case. This has led a lot of commentaries to say that Jesus' trial was just straight up illegal. But there's some pushback on this, okay? I, I, I mean, I was going to say this myself as well, that this was just an illegal trial. And, but as I was researching it, I found there are a few problems. One, uh, the Mishnah, the rules that we have for capital punishment, we're not sure if they actually do trace back to Jesus' time specifically. Okay, th it was codified 200 years later. That's when it was, rather was written down. It's a little tough reading the Mishnah. Some of the content definitely goes back to Jesus, definitely goes prior to Jesus, but some of the content does not. Some of it clearly comes later, after the destruction of the temple even. So the Mishnah is kind of a mixed bag. It's a little challenging sometimes. Some passages, like the one on the rules about capital trials, it may or may not have been written when Jesus, uh, when his trial took place. Uh, well, it wasn't written, but it may or may not have been in place when Jesus' trial took place. There's another problem, and that is, uh, they actually aren't technically doing a capital trial. They do want to put him to death, but they don't actually sentence him to death. If you notice later in the passage, they sentence him to being deserving of death. Then they take him to Pilate, and they try to get Pilate to sentence him to death. So in context, they're not looking to actually execute Jesus, but to build a case to bring Jesus to Pilate to have the Romans execute him because they don't have the power to execute the, the limitations on their governing power, one of those limitations was the ability to execute at the time. Still, okay, so it may not have been, I can't say, okay, it broke all five laws about capital punishments, possibly. Maybe some of those laws were in place. Maybe they do or don't apply to a, a this weird scenario where it's more like a um, preliminary assessment and not exactly a full-on trial. But the trial's still sketchy for a number of reasons that we're going to get into, and it should be obvious to you that it is. Um, verse 54, let's look at them. Peter had followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he was sitting with the officers and warming himself by the fire. Okay, this is it. This is all you hear of Peter until we get way, way down past all the stuff about Jesus into verse 66. Then Peter shows up again. I'll be covering this later, but I want to say real, real briefly, um, and, and I don't, I hope I'm not stepping on any toes. I know there's a number of pastors even that watch and this content and you consider maybe you're studying to teach on Mark um, and you're about to teach and you get to this passage and you're like, ooh, I have a great point to share with people about Peter. Here's what I've heard some pastors say about Peter at this point. They turn Peter into like an allegory. Peter is bringing an allegorical like, um, this is one of my pet peeves in, in Bible studies, just so you all know. <laughs> when someone brings a good, a good teaching, a good lesson, but it's not really connected to the scripture. Um, when that's the case and you're a pastor studying and you have, I have a good application, but it's not really connected to the scripture. Don't do it. You know what? Just say, guys, this is not connected to the script. Don't pretend that your application is connected to the scripture when it's not. Here's my example of how this happens. People will say, Peter had a three-step process for, for when he denied Jesus. Step one, he was following Jesus at a distance. And that's right there in verse 54. Peter was following at a distance. Guys, don't follow. Here's how it goes. Don't follow Jesus at a distance. Stay close to Jesus. And so now Peter's following at a distance, which was just a physical description. It's now considered an allegory for um, my discipleship in Christ. I'm not being very close to him, right? I'm sort of following Jesus at a distance metaphorically. Step two, you know, Peter first did that. Step two, he's then warming himself by the fire of the world. There's the world and their heat. The warmth of their fire is giving you warmth as you're warming yourself. Oh, this is step two, guys. Don't warm yourself with the comforts of the world. First, you're following Jesus at a distance. Next thing you know, you're finding yourself, you know, trying to make yourself feel good with sinful things, trying to bring joy and happiness into your life with compromises. And let me be clear, you guys, this, this is good advice. This is all good advice. 
right? But it has nothing to do with what Peter's actually doing, um, in my opinion. <laughs> I know I'm trying. I may be coming off a little too strong here. I'm not trying to be mean or anything, but but I think this is a good example of something that is not healthy to do to the body of Christ. Um, let me. I'll explain why in just a second. The impact of it. But the third step for Peter, we get down later on when we get to verse 62 and stuff, is where Peter denies Jesus. So this is where the pastor warns the congregation. Right now, perhaps you're following at a distance. Perhaps right now you're starting to warm yourself with the comforts of the world. Sin is bringing you peace in your life. You're looking to sin to like be your therapy, um, to bring you warmth. And the next step is you may end up denying Christ, just like Peter did. Okay, these are actually good applications, I think. It's a, it's, a, it's a little daunting to think about it, but it's actually good application for us. It's just not about Peter. Um, Peter doesn't connect us to this. Peter's following at a distance doesn't mean following like as a partial disciple, he's kind of following Jesus, kind of not. Like that's not really what it means. It literally means Peter's the only one that, we're, that we read about in Mark anyway. John was nearby as well. But the only one we read about Mark who is actually like still kind of trying to stay near to where Jesus was so he could see what was going to happen to Jesus. I don't think it's meant to be a metaphor. I think that what we lose from this passage when we when we latch on to say a really good application from a wrong interpretation, what we lose is that Peter's actually showing some bravery here. Peter um, has seen Jesus in agony in the garden. He has seen Judas betray Jesus and he knows Jesus went forward, forward willingly. And he's at this point very confused, but maybe he's still hoping. And this is the application I'd have. I think maybe he's still hoping that he's right about what Jesus will do. And he's waiting for Jesus to like overcome somehow. You know, he's going to, Jesus is going to come out like any minute now, Jesus is going to walk out of the chambers with the high priest declaring him as the Messiah. And then the Jewish nation will unite under Christ. Like maybe he's thinking that will happen. He's not really believing Jesus will be crucified as he said he would. So if you have an application for what Peter's going through for your life, I think this is it. My attitude towards my own confusion and the shock of unexpected suffering while I wait for glory. That's what Peter's going through. He can't give up, and I've met people like this. Maybe you're like this. He can't give up the idea that the suffering he's seeing can't be happening. It can't be in God's will. And so he just can't overcome it. Uh, Peter, of course, flips later on. He has a completely different attitude towards suffering. Here, he can't comprehend how suffering that makes no sense to him could be in the will and glory of God. And that, to me, is our application. Um that we have for it, not about following at a distance. All right, I'll I'll move on. I'll move on. This is my little I'm a little pet peeve. Uh, last oh last thought on this. If we as teachers, if we do this, if we take passages, and because we just get addicted to how good this application is, we start abusing a passage. You know, we take it and we we turn everything into allegory. Um, it will probably make people feel good, and it may even spiritually help them in some sense. But what it's going to do is create a vulnerability in the congregation where they're not very good at knowing how to interpret the Bible because they've heard stuff abused and they've grown accustomed to passages being taken out of context. When they approach someone, encounter someone who has false theology, they're not equipped to deal with the verses those people will take out of context. So that's why I say, look, there's comfort and wisdom for us in every area of life. We just don't want to quote the wrong passage to bring that comfort and wisdom. All right, let's look at the next verse, which is 55. Now, the chief priests and the whole council kept uh, trying to obtain testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but right, they're not finding any. They need, they need someone to accuse Jesus, but there's problems. There's problems, which is that they need to have multiple witnesses that agree. Verse 56, for many were giving false testimony against him, but their testimony was not consistent. Now, here's problem number one, I'll call it, even though this is like the third issue, but uh, for, the, for calling the court... Um, against Jesus in this case. This shows that the trial is wrong. It's immoral. It's definitely an abuse of power, um, but you can see how it is right here. First off, the court calls for witnesses. Now, the way the law works, right? Courts aren't supposed to call for witnesses, right? Maybe, you know, at a certain point, they, they extend, are there any other witnesses, that kind of thing. But actually it's the people, it's the, it's the victims or the, or the witnesses who call for the court. That's the big difference. You see, it should be the witness who goes to the court and says, I saw Jesus do such and such. I have another witness here that will agree. And then they, then they convene a court case. But here, first they get Jesus. 
And then they put out a call for witnesses. This means that the court is oppressing Christ, oppressing him, using their power to oppress him. They don't want to follow the right procedure. They're looking for witnesses instead of it being witnesses asking for the court. This is why they actually have trouble condemning Jesus because they can't, they don't even have the right accusations against him. Uh, they just grabbed him when they could. Now we know that the court's agenda was to kill Jesus. Mark 14, one tells us that they had, the chief priest scribes, these people had already been looking for a way to seize Jesus by stealth and kill him. So they're not interested in upholding the law. Um, the law here then, the law is being so abused. I mean, it's meant to bring people freedom from oppression. That's what the law is supposed to be. As I read the prophets, as I read what God wrote to Israel as well in their law, the law is meant to stop oppression. That's actually a big emphasis. And I realize that um, uh, in our world today, oppression becomes like a key word that some people say, Mike, stop saying like stop oppression because it sounds like you're using critical race theory or something. But here's the thing. Um, I'm going to start with scripture and then I want to apply that biblical worldview across all those issues. There's Mika saying hi. And those issues include oppression. Like this is, this is a big deal. The, one of the reasons why governments have laws is to stop oppression of people. This Look up the word oppression in the Bible and you'll see this is a very, very big deal to God. And I'm not going to back off of a real agenda to stop oppression because someone will think that that's, um, you know, I'm being too, too liberal or something like that. Like I'm going to start with scripture and live that out. And I know it's just, it's going to irritate people, but it's also going to give peace to others who realize, yeah, this is a big deal. So here's the strange thing. They want to kill Jesus. Why don't they just accept the false testimony, right? They get false testimony, but this is the whole agenda. The court just wants to kill Jesus. But it seems as though they had um, procedures in place. Are you, what are you, where are you going? Where are you going, cat? This is her. Uh, it seems like they had procedures in place where they had to double check the testimony of the witnesses. Now we do read about this in the Mishnah and it may have come later, except here's the thing. Mishnahic rules about capital punishment may have come later. This wasn't perhaps technically a capital trial, but rules about just how to interrogate witnesses. There's a good chance that's, that goes back to Jesus's time since they've been doing this forever. Hey, hey, figure out where you're going. Come over here. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so what I'm saying, what I'm trying to say is, uh, I think the court was constrained by policies that had them double checking the witnesses' testimonies. Now in the Mishnah, the way it's written is, they would pull the witnesses aside, you know, say one witness says, he said this, another one says, he said that, and they agree. They pull them aside and be like, what day did he say it? What time did he say it? Right? So they would interrogate the witnesses. Was he by this tree or that tree? And if it, if it didn't agree, then they had to discount that testimony. So... This gets in the way. Many gave false witness against him, but their testimony is not consistent. But this leads us to problem number two in the trial, which is that there's no consequences for false witnesses. Under the, uh, the, the law for Israel in Deuteronomy 19, 16, listen to what happens when you bring false witness to try to get somebody, in this case, killed. If a malicious witness rises up against a man to accuse him of wrongdoing, then both the men who have the dispute who shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who will be in office in those days. That, that is this courtroom that he's in front of now. Priests and judges and the elders. The judges shall investigate thoroughly. And if the witness is a false witness and he has accused his brother falsely, now what happens? What should have been done to all these false witnesses against Jesus? Then you shall do to him just as he had intended to do to his brother. Thus you shall purge the evil from among you. Wow. And this was meant to, to prevent the abuse of the law, right? The rest will hear and be afraid and will never again do such an evil thing among you. Now, if we applied this in modern courts, this would mean that if someone accused you of a crime and then you found out they were, it was discovered, not you're uncer uncertain, right? Maybe there's not enough evidence to convict, but that doesn't make them a false witness, but rather you find they're a false witness. They're relying to, uh, to get you in trouble. Then they would get the, the penalty. Say you were going to owe $10,000. Now they owe $10,000. Um, yeah, that would help stop some frivolous lawsuits, I think. And this didn't happen in the case of Jesus. These false witnesses appear to have no consequences at all. Do you see the court is being in unjust? They're being unjust. And it's very obvious because they how they handle the trial. Then verse 57, going back to Mark 14. It says, some stood up and began to give false testimony against him saying, and here's the specific statement 
This causes a lot of problems for Jesus and the disciples later. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and in three days I will build another made without hands. But not even in this respect was their testimony consistent. Now, there's a couple issues with this. This exact phrase, um, destroy the temple made with hands, three days build another made without hands. Obviously, Jesus didn't say this exactly. Mark isn't saying that. Mark is saying he was accused of this. Jesus said something similar, and it was twisted like so they could use his words against him. And this happens every time I do anything online. <laughs> my, my, your, whatever you say can and will be twisted and used against you. Um, but what's interesting here is that in Mark, there's nothing even similar to this that Jesus says. The closest you get is Mark 13, where Jesus says that the temple will be destroyed. But he doesn't say anything about his agency being involved in any fashion. John 2, 19 is the only place where we actually have a similar passage. And this is where Jesus, this is probably what the, the saying they're twisting. Jesus says, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Right? And we learned from John, Jesus was talking about his body. Notice he says, for them to destroy this temple, not him. He's not the one who's going to destroy the temple. This is what gets Jesus in trouble. They pretend he was claiming he would destroy the temple. And in three days I will raise it up. He's talking about his body. He's going to raise his body back up. Resurrect. Notice that Jesus is the agent of the resurrection. Um, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit in the Bible little fun Trinitarian moment for you. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit were all given credit for the resurrection of Jesus. He was raised by the Spirit. The Father raised him, and he's going to raise himself because we see this Trinitarian work happening at the resurrection of Christ. Um, so this is a distortion of Jesus' words. And what's interesting is that in uh, Mark, they don't agree. So it seems in this case, the testimony of the witnesses did agree on what Jesus supposedly said, but they didn't agree on some of the other issues, like perhaps where he was when he said it, what time he was, um, how did you hear him, where were you? Like they asked him these sort of like follow-up questions and it didn't work out. This ends up frustrating the court and the high priest takes a new tactic. We'll talk about that in a second. But before we move on to that, um, because they couldn't get the witnesses to kill him um, or to condemn him, I should say. This same statement is used against Stephen in the book of Acts. Let's look at this as well, because this became like the thing that like non, non messianic, non Christian Jews were saying against the Jews who were following Jesus. They started saying this same statement. Oh, he's going to destroy the temple because then the Christians got a reputation of being anti temple. And the interesting thing is that it's, it's not true that they were anti-temple, right? Peter, they were still going to the temple. They were still even partaking in sacrifices for, for the, in the book of Acts. Although they were teaching that no one, uh, the Gentiles didn't have to become Jewish to become Christians. So there, there's like a truth that's there, but they did continue to use this attack on the Christians and it did work. So in Acts 6.13, they're going to kill, G, uh, kill um, Stephen. And they use the same accusation. They put forward false witnesses who said, this man incessantly speaks against this holy place in the law, right? That, which is a distortion. It's true that the Christians were teaching that Jews, the Gentiles could be saved without obeying the law, but they weren't telling Jews, don't obey the law, destroy the law. Like, no, this, it's, it's more of a doctrine of fulfillment of the law than it was destroying. And you read the, you read the gospels or you look at my Hebrew roots series and you'll see the teaching on that. It's, it's better than that. It's more nuanced than that. But then they quote this, for we've heard him say that this Nazarene Jesus will destroy this place, the temple, alter the customs which Moses hand, handed down to us. And this is not true. Jesus rather was going to um, create a new temple, right? He wasn't going to destroy the temple. That was going to be judgment that would come in the future. But he was going to create a new temple, which is those who believe in him. We're the body of Christ. We're the temple of the Holy Spirit. And he wasn't going to alter the customs. He was going to fulfill them. Why do I say this? Because this is a great example of how... Um, a careful and important doctrine of Christian faith can be distorted, oversimplified, and used as a hammer to attack Christians. So let's take the teaching Christians have on the topic of homosexuality. I just bring up the word, and there's people uncomfortable right now just hearing me say it. Um, because the world generally doesn't, doesn't care, as far as I can tell, doesn't care what Christians actually believe on the topic. They care how they can use the topic to create division and anger and discontent amongst people, especially towards believers. You know, I've regularly been witnessing where I talk to people and they're convinced that if I'm a Christian and I'm consistent, I'm automatically homophobic. And I'm like, I, it's like I have to do hard work to make sure. Yeah, I mean, one, one girl one time at a school, public school, um, I was doing a, a thing there. The Christian club invited me and I, I 
did some Q&A in front of the, the, the kids during lunch in, in the public school. And this girl asked the question. She goes, why does Jesus hate gay people? Right? This is exactly the thing that happened to Jesus, happened to Stephen. This idea of I'm going to take a triggering topic. I'm going to misrepresent your beliefs on it and then put you on the defense. And so I, I, my response at the time was, you know, Jesus doesn't, uh, I, I said, would you, would you hate, no, what was I said to her? I said, would you die for somebody that you hated? Would you give your life for someone you hated? And she's like, no. And I said, well, Jesus died for all of us. And you see, it was, I was trying to be <laughs> careful how I answer this because I don't think people want a, a, a thoughtful explanation of a detailed understanding of Christian teachings on say transgender issues and homosexual topics and things like that. They're more interested sometimes in just bringing up triggering topics that cause rage against people. Why do I bring this up? Okay, here's the bad news. Jesus didn't actually hide from this. The, uh, the early church, Stephen was literally stoned and killed after this stuff that they said about him. As Christians, it is not your job to stop people from being angry at you. It is your job to represent true, authentic Christianity wherever you go. And if people respond with anger because of misrepresentations, misunderstandings, and sometimes because they don't even care what the truth of Christianity is, that's not your fault. It's not your job. Your job at that moment is very important. And your job and my job is to return kindness for anger, to return gentleness for harshness, right? To turn the other cheek. That is our, our task at that moment. And... So we'll move on. Mark 14, 60. This is where the high priest, he gives up on trying to get witnesses against Jesus. And now he asks him some direct questions. The high priest stood up and came forward and questioned Jesus saying, do you not answer what it is or what is it that these men are testifying against you? He wants Jesus to talk about these accusations, even though they're, they're, aren't, they're all false witnesses. So he has nothing he needs to defend. But he kept silent and did not answer. And again, the high priest was questioning him. And saying to him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one? Now, Jesus stays silent and doesn't answer. Before I get to verse 61, uh, the rest of it, let's talk about this first part. Why doesn't Jesus answer? I can think of three reasons. And this is a great Bible study habit right here. You read a passage and you go, he didn't answer. Why? Why is a great question in the Bible. Why? Why didn't Jesus answer? Okay. So I've got a few possibilities. One is Jesus is fulfilling scripture. Um, Isaiah 53, 7. Jesus, Jesus, obviously, in the Gospel of Mark, is very interested in Isaiah, Isaiah 53 in particular, and Isaiah, the servant songs of Isaiah, which we'll talk about in a minute, really amazing stuff. But Isaiah 53, 7, it says he was oppressed and afflicted, it, he did not open his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep before, uh, that is silent before its shearers, he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. This is like a description of the very court case Jesus is in right now. And he's staying silent before them. This is to fulfill scripture. But that's only one of the reasons. We'll talk more about this, why, why this is remarkable, that Isaiah 53 is so packed with so many details about Christ um, at this season of his life, especially the cross. Another reason, though, why he stayed silent was to be condemned. You know, pragmatically, just humanly, Jesus wanted to, Want, I mean, he didn't want to, but he wanted to because he wants to do the do the plan, right? He doesn't enjoy it, though. Um, but he wants to be condemned. Jesus, we, we, we know Jesus offered clever words to get out of trouble many times. We read about it all the time in the Gospels. I'll bet you there was some combination of words Jesus could have given that would have turned all this against against the people in the court, that would have co exposed their issues, that where he could have appealed to some um, something, you know, that would have, probably got him off the hook. I think Jesus still could have gotten away. So he says, he says nothing. This is so he'll be condemned. And then three, and this hits my heart. I think Jesus says nothing in his own defense because you have nothing in your defense. Like when you stand before God, there are not false witnesses. These are, God has witnessed all you've ever done wrong and he knows it all. And as I stand before him one day for my life to be examined, like I have zero defense except Jesus. Like my only defense is Jesus standing in my place, taking the punishment for what I've done. Jesus's silence is, is ironic because he's silent because he's innocent and could prove himself innocent, right? He's also silent because I have no defense for my sins and he goes in my place and he is condemned for me. Now, this is encouraging to me as a Christian. 
If you're not a Christian, I want you to understand this. This is how Christians handle guilt. We handle guilt by offering nothing in our defense. No excuses. Not, uh, you know, Lord, I, I only did that because of the way I was raised. I only did that because I was, I was having a bad day. I wouldn't have done that if they hadn't done that to me first. We offer none of that stuff. Like all that stuff goes off the table and we, and we face our guilt in, in the full shamefulness of it. And we hand it to Christ and we say, you carry this to the cross. This is healthy, healthy handling of guilt where, you know, it's washed and clean with no excuse, no justification, just an advocate who goes in my place and pays for it. Then he gives me his righteousness instead. This is beautiful. I think that, um, it's what we need. We need to understand this. We need to understand this. So, um, let's look then at, um, the rest of verse 61, which says, and he began, um, uh, again, the high priest was questioning him. So he hits him with a new thing. He's going to ignore all the accusations. Here's something that would trigger everybody big time. He asked him this question. Are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one? Are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one? Uh, the way this is worded in Greek is really interesting because <clears throat> uh, in the Greek, it's hard, I guess, to communicate this in English, but in the Greek, um, the idea is that it's like an assertion the high priest is making. So there's a lot of irony layered into this moment right here. And one of the ironies is the high priest himself is declaring Christ is this, he, Jesus is the Christ, the son of the blessed one. And he's, but he's doing it as a, as a question to confirm it. Um, this puts it on the lips of the high priest that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the blessed one. The next person who will affirm this in Mark is the centurion who helps crucify Jesus in 1539. That is the guy who's like, surely this was the Christ, you know, the son of the blessed one, um, the son of God. Actually, he's a son of God. Interestingly enough, um, blessed one is a, is a substitute for the word God. And <clears throat> they would often do that. Right? They're, they're not going to use the divine name. They're often not even going to say God. They're going to say like blessed one or the power as Jesus will say in the next verse. But the centurion in verse 39 of chapter 15, when he says Jesus is the son of God, he doesn't replace the divine name. Why? Because he's not a Jew. So he doesn't have that habit. Interesting little tidbit. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the, the, the moment we're having right here. Um, there's, there's what scholars will call the messianic secret. <clears throat> um, and a lot of people have, have, have acknowledged it. And it's a, it's a good thing to acknowledge. There's this messianic secret in Mark where Jesus is like telling people, you know, don't tell them who I am. He tells the disciples, you know, yeah, I'm the Christ. He confirms it through Peter. Right. But he tells them, don't tell anybody. Um, and so some people have had just some real fun with this. And they've suggested that things like, uh, Jesus didn't really even know he was the Messiah or he wasn't sure he wanted to be the Messiah. So he's like, don't tell anyone. I'm not really sure if I want to be known, you know, and they give all these weird things, these weird motives to Jesus or to the author of the gospels of Mark, Matthew, Luke, um, in order to say that like, yeah, Jesus never said he was the Messiah actually. And they're trying to cover it up by saying, oh, he said he was, but he told us not to tell anyone. I think all of these are dead ends and, and wastes of time in the end. Um, the messianic secret in Mark, when you read it in context, and I hope I've made it clear in this Mark study, and this is very, we're getting, there's a lot of theology stuff we're getting into here, but Mark doesn't so much have a secret as it does have a lesson about the Messiah. And the idea of don't tell people, don't tell people is all couched in the idea that the Messiah is a certain kind of Messiah. You see in Israel at the time, there's different versions of Messiah. They have, a, they have tons of texts from the Old Testament. They're not really sure how it's all going to play out. They might think the Messiah is just a political leader. They might think the Messiah is going to come and die. They might think there's a different Messiah. There's two Messiahs. There's one son of Joseph, one they called the son of David. And they have two Messiahs. One of them dies and the other one's the reigning ruling Messiah. They don't, however, have a real understanding that, G, that the Messiah is the atoning sacrifice for their sin. They just haven't accepted, just like Peter hadn't, what Isaiah had said about Jesus, what Psalm 22 had said about Jesus. Mm -hmm. I say all this to say, this moment right here is like, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one? This is when the nature of who Messiah is comes out. And Messiah is not just a human figure who's going to do a political thing. That's what most of the views of Messiah were at the time. Not all of them, but most of them. James Edwards in his commentary, he says this. 
This is about the deity of Christ in Mark. He says, until the question of the high priest, however, Jesus has steadfastly silenced all proclamations of his divine sonship, right? That he is the son of God. Mark said it in chapter one, but, but publicly it hasn't been stated yet. In order truly to understand the meaning of his person, something has been missing. The missing element has been the necessity of his suffering. Only in the light of suffering can Jesus openly divulge his identity as God's son, at the trial, the veil is finally removed. The malevolence which the Jewish authorities have harbored since the beginning of Jesus' ministry is finally exposed. Hence, the secret that Jesus has protected since the beginning of his ministry can now be disclosed. This is key, okay? Again, that you have to have a careful study of the passages in, in Mark to understand this. The, the, the high priest is not just asking Jesus if he's the Messiah. He's asking if he's divine, and Jesus is confirming, I am. This is huge. This is like the, the Christological climax of the gospel. This verse 61 and 62, that's what R.T. Franz calls it. The Christological climax of the gospel. And for those who want to suggest Mark has a low Christology, the reality is, is that Mark has been trying to defeat low Christology all the way through the text of Mark until he could reveal openly the full like divinity that there is in Christ. And that comes right now. The messianic secret is really a revelation that Jesus is divine. And then there's two revelations. One's glorious and one's terrible, right? Jesus is divine, the glorious revelation. The Messiah, his, his nature is divine. He's God with us. And the, the terrible one is that he's going to die on the cross in the place of your sins, being punished for what you've done wrong. These are the two things that have to come out. They have to come out. This is the theology of the Messiah. Um, now look at Jesus' answer. Jesus says, I am... And you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. He's actually quotes, okay, there's, there's three incredibly awesome things happening in this verse. Jesus' I am statement implies something like deity. I'll get there in a second. Then he quotes, the, you'll see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power. This is from Psalm 110 verse 1. And then you'll also see me coming in the clouds of heaven. When you take all three of these together, they're a powerful case, I think, for the divinity of Christ. A high Christology, in other words. So let's walk through them one at a time. Uh, let's first take the I am statement. Jesus says, I am. Um, let's see here. Um, okay. The I am statement, um, many of you already know this, right? Because you've read John's gospel and it has the I am statements of Jesus. There's obviously an I am. I am is a divine title, right? I am by itself is used as a divine title. This is Exodus 3.14. Or you, you also need to couple that with Isaiah 43, 10 and verse 13, because those passages, God very, makes it very clear that simply saying, I am by itself can be a divine title. So Jesus uses that phrase in verse 62. It's I am ego a me in the Greek. That's where what, what's there in the Greek of the Old Testament, the, Sept, the Septuagint in those same passages. Now, Jesus there's a debate on this, right? Like some people say, look, it's just coincidental. Jesus is really just saying, I am the Christ, the son of the blessed one. He's not also saying I am God, but son of the blessed one, that is a divine title, right? He's the son of the blessed one. He's the son of God. That's not a, humans aren't going to be called that. Uh, it's called blasphemy by the high priest later when he confirms it, but there's more. So I'm going to build a case right now. I could be wrong, but I'm going to build a case why I think this I am statement in Mark is meant to be like a deity statement from Jesus that I, he's like claiming deity for himself. Well, in Mark uh, 650, Jesus is walking on water. I've touched on this several times before, so I'll briefly mention it here. But in Mark 650, they're terrified as he's, he's going to walk by them, but then he decides to come to them, right? Uh, immediately, he spoke with them and said to them, take courage. It is I do not be afraid. <clears throat> this is I am. This is ego me. In the English, we translate it. <clears throat> differently, but it is. And the reason why this is significant is because the passage that is being alluded to in Mark here, clearly alluded to, is Job chapter 9, verses 8 through 11. I won't walk you through the whole thing because I've done this before when we were when I taught through uh, Mark uh, chapter uh, 6. But this is, this is where God is the one who alone, he alone stretches out the heavens. Only God does that. And what does he do? He tramples down the waves of the sea. That is alluded to in the description of Jesus walking on the on the lake, the Sea of Galilee. 
um, who makes the bear and the Orion, the Pleiades, and the chambers of the South, who does great things and unfathomable and wondrous works. Then Job says this about God. Were he to pass by me, I would not see him. Were he to move past me, I would not perceive him. And Job's complaint throughout the book of Job is he wishes there was a mediator between him and God. He wishes someone could bring him near to God so he could be close to God and talk to God and understand God better. He says God alone walks on the water. Jesus, in Mark's gospel, walks on the water. He says, if he were to pass me by, I would not see him. Well, he's be- Jesus in the passage is strange. He's beginning to pass them by. But guess what? They see him. He says, I would not perceive him. But guess what? They do perceive him. He goes, look, it's me. It is I. And the term he uses to describe himself is I am, which can be a divine title. I've talked about this in more detail, but let me just summarize. Ooh, that's the awesome story. We'll get there in a minute. Um, <clears throat> Jesus Unlike in the Old Testament, when he's like, Job's crying out, oh, if God was only near to me, oh, he walks on the water, but he'll, he'll just pass me by. I can never see him. Jesus walks on the water. He's God with us. He's God drawing near to us. He's God answering the cry of Job and the cry of our hearts to know God and to be near God. Jesus then comes and in that context where he's doing something only God does, he says, I am. Then As I build my case here, multiple pieces in my case for Jesus using the I am statement in Mark chapter 14 um, is that this is in the context of Mark, right? In Mark 650, there's a very deity like um, laden passage, the usage of I am in a passage that really feels like a deity of Christ passage in many ways. And then he uses it again later in another passage that is just covered in deity related concepts. Are you the son of the blessed one? That implies deity. Also, Jesus' use of Daniel, which we'll talk about in a minute, the way he uses Daniel implies his deity because uh, he's the one who is worshipped by all nations and God alone should receive that kind of worship. And then Luke, in the Gospel of Luke, says, uh, has this, you rightly say that I am, right? But So the I am statement is in Luke as well as Matthew or as well as Mark, but in Matthew, it's not there. In Matthew, Matthew doesn't record all of what Jesus says here. He just says, you have said so. So he's uh, Matthew's emphasis is the high priest is the one who proclaimed it. And Jesus affirmed the high priest said who he was. But again, Matthew is probably not recording word for word. Um, so we have two um, accounts there. And it's also consistent with Jesus's use of I am in the gospel of John, right? Jesus clearly uses I am as a divine title in John. And unless you're going to take John as being like invented by somebody other than Jesus here, that seems like a pretty strong case to me. So let's move forward. Um, what is Jesus condemned for in this trial? Notice this. That I'm talking about the divinity of Christ here, right? The, the gospel of Mark has Jesus as the divine one, as God with us. What is Jesus condemned for? Jesus is not condemned for being the Messiah. This is a common mistake people make. It wasn't wrong. Like it wasn't considered worthy of death to call yourself the Messiah. Let me read to you uh, James Edwards' commentary on this. Again, I think this is, he has great points on this. I think two weeks ago, I was telling you where I thought he was wrong on something, but, but here I think he's got, he hit the nail on the head. And he says this, it is often supposed that Jesus' claim to be the Messiah triggered the explosion from the high priest and his condemnation by the Sanhedrin. This is not the case. It was no crime to call oneself the Messiah or to be called so by others. For as Justin Martyr later acknowledged, the Messiah would be only a man among men. This is what the Jews were thinking of the Messiah at the time. A century after Jesus, Rabbi Akiba openly declared Bar Kokhba, leader of the second revolt against Rome, to be the Messiah. And a mass of people believed it, even after Bar Kokhba's death. The charge of blasphemy was thus not owing to any messianic claim, perhaps not even to the charge that Jesus would destroy the temple. Remember, those were conflicting testimonies. Blasphemy was not breaking a holy commandment or even profaning a holy place, but the audacity to ascribe God's honor to oneself or to equate oneself with God. It was the claim to be God's son, not Messiah, that sealed Jesus' fate before the Sanhedrin. The charge of blasphemy is powerful, if indirect, proof of Jesus' claim to be the son of God. Do you guys get the idea that this, the reason why Jesus is responded to the way he is from the high priest is because he's claiming divinity, not just messianic identity, right? Because it's important to Jesus that when you think Messiah, you think son of God, you think God with us, and you also think must suffer for our sins. These are two key issues, and this these are core issues in Christianity. What I'm saying is the central faith of, of, of Christians 
in the identity of Christ, right? That he's, he's man and God and also his suffering on the cross for our sins and rising. This is what was always central in the mind and heart of Jesus for us to, ner- to learn and know. And he orchestrated his life on earth so he could force this upon us, reveal it to us and teach us this. Jesus's confession. Let's talk about Jesus' confession here. Um, Mark 6, no, 14. (laughs) Hold on. I know what I'm doing. Mark chapter 14. Look at what Jesus says. We talked about the I am. Now let's look at the rest. Uh, I am and you shall see the son of man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. This part coming with the clouds of heaven. Let's talk about this part first. This uh, combines, there's two allusions here. This is to Daniel 7, verse 13 and 14. And when you look at the passage in Daniel, you'll see there are also allusions to the to the divinity of Christ in this passage. And when Jesus says it in this context, that seems to be the emphasis. So Daniel sees a vision of the end times and of the final kingdom of God and of the person who's going to rule over the final eternal kingdom. So he says, I kept looking in the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the ancient of days and was presented before him. That that would be God, right? The father. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. So he's going to, you know, reign as king over all nations, all people. He'll be the ultimate ruler of all for all time. And what is he? He's a son of man. And what is he going to be? Served by all people. Now that word serve is very interesting in the Hebrew. That word serve is generally used. It's pretty much used to imply the worship of a deity. It's religious worship service. That's what it is. And everyone's going to serve him. Now, when you just take all the, I remember I've talked about the subtle theology of Mark. It's sort of subtle, but it's kind of in your face at the same time. It's like, if you, if you realize what they're saying, it's pretty it's pretty slap in the face with the deity of Christ. Um, but here, put it all together. It's a very heavy passage. Also, this son of man, um, by the way, this puts Jesus' son of man statement in context. Jesus, when he calls himself son of man, he doesn't just mean he's human. He means he's the eschatological, like the, the end times ruler over all of God's kingdom, receiving uh, service and being over all nations and all people for all time. So he's obviously claiming more than just being a human. Um but the, um, the interesting thing is about him coming in the clouds or with the clouds. So depending on your, your translation and between Mark and Daniel, it's written slightly differently with the clouds, on the clouds. And this connects to Psalm 68, 4 and Deuteronomy 33, 26, where it's God, Yahweh, who rides on the clouds. Yahweh. Now, this is kind of a big deal. Um, I've talked about it before, so I won't get into details about it, but it's kind of like a thing, right? Like, a, like they would know it. Like if you're part of that ancient Near Eastern context, you would know that the claim to be the one who's coming on the clouds or with the clouds, that's kind of a big claim. Like it's a deity claim and the son of man's coming with the clouds. So that implies deity as well, subtly, at least, um, Jesus is also saying he's going to judge them. Now this is ironic because he's standing before the judges of Israel and they're judging him and he tells them he's going to judge them. Now, some will later on say that Jesus, when he's on the cross and he says like, God, why have you forsaken me? That Jesus is totally confused. Here's an apologetic moment for us, right? Uh, Apologetics, like defending the faith. And they'll say, Jesus is confused. He's on the cross. He doesn't know what's going on. He's confused. He's in despair. Yet literally standing before the men who are going to condemn him, he tells them, I'm going to judge you one day. Obviously, Jesus is not confused. (laughs) That's um, something Barney Aaron should stop saying. The next passage Jesus quotes is from Psalm 110. And in verse one, and I, it's going to be a longer study today. I apologize for those who are bothered by that. If you ever find my studies are too long, you always can stop watching the video. I find that that works very very well, (laughs) but I can't help it, man. I just too much good stuff to share. All right. Psalm 110 one says, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Okay. Remember, um, he said, sitting at the right hand of power. Now commentaries all agree. Jesus is quoting Psalm 110 one. In fact, this is the most commonly quoted verse in the entire New Testament. It quotes this verse of the Bible more than anywhere else. Jesus had previously used this verse to imply his deity. Let me go there. I just, do you see everything about this is like pointing to the deity of Christ in Mark's gospel, which some would say have a low Christology. Mark 12, 35, Jesus 
talks about Psalm 110.1. And he actually does kind of a Bible study on it. He says, um, how is it that the scribes say that Christ is the son of David? Right? What's the identity of the Christ? Is he merely the son of David? David himself said in the spirit, and he quotes the psalm. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies beneath your feet. David himself calls him Lord. So in what sense is he his son? Jesus wants the, the careful theology of the New Testament to be in place. In what sense is he David's son? Oh, according to his human lineage. He's from the line of David through Mary. But he's also David's Lord. Because before David ever existed, Jesus was the, the, the Almighty. And so, yeah, that's what Jesus quotes when he stands before, um, before them and they're asking, are you the son of the blessed? And he quotes this verse because he's trying to say, um, sorry, let me take us back there. Because he's trying to say, yes, like I am deity laden statement. And you shall see the son of man sitting at the right hand of power, deity laden verse reference, coming with the clouds of heaven, deity laden eschatological Daniel 7 reference. And I think that this is very powerful, very powerful. So one of the key things that Mark wants us to know is Jesus is more glorious than they expected. He's God with us. Um, the other thing is that Jesus has to suffer and die. That's the other thing. And this we start to get into in verse 63. <clears throat> Tearing his clothes, the high priest said, what further need do we have of witnesses? Tearing his clothes was a traditional thing they would do. Like it was meant to say, I've heard a horrible blasphemy and I'm responding to it. Um, oddly, he's the one blaspheming Christ right now in reality. Then it says, um, you've heard him blasphemy. How does it seem to you? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. So again, they're not actually giving him the death penalty. They don't have the power to do that. They, it seems like they're agreeing, okay, guys, let's use our authority to try to get Pilate to kill him. But then they can sort of say, hey, it's on Pilate. Like, we don't have to follow our normal procedures. They're kind of trying to get around the real rule of law here. And <clears throat> so they condemn him to be deserving of death. This makes you wonder if Nicodemus was around, if Josephus, uh, uh, Joseph of Arimathea was around. They were both part of this council. Um, but they may not have been there. If they all condemned it to death, or it might be that Mark just says all, meaning like a large majority, so we'll just say they all condemned it to death. Um, or might be that they weren't invited. People didn't know that Nicodemus was interested in Jesus. They may have deliberately not invited him to this nighttime meeting. Um, our, uh, <clears throat> in American history, we've had times where congressmen were simply not invited to things because people didn't want them to vote. Mark 14, 65, uh, some began to spit at him and to blindfold him and to beat him with their fists and to say to him, prophesy. And, and the officers received him with slaps in the face. <clears throat> the treatment that Jesus gets here is shocking, shocking treatment. It's like a mocking game that they do to Jesus where they blindfold him. <coughs> Pardon me. They blindfold him first and then they punch him and then they mock him. Hey, tell us who hit you. That's why they say prophesy. They're like, say, tell us who hit you. And they're handing him to officer and officer and each officer who, who takes him next hits him again. Uh, Jesus, his, his abuse and his suffering did not begin on the cross. It started way earlier. Um, at this point he's tired. He's, um, stressed out more than about as, as stressed out as you could possibly be. As we see from the drops of blood that he's sweating is that medical condition is a high stress thing. Um, and now he's being beaten. Now, when, when somebody hits you and you see it coming, you brace for impact. If you don't see it coming, it's a lot worse. And he's blindfolded and being hit. I just think God is so patient. God loves these people so much that he wants these same people beating Jesus to be saved. He doesn't just strike them dead. Like he doesn't Thanos snap them out of existence. You may have been raging against these people, but Jesus' heart is, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. So powerful. Now the irony here, I said this passage is layered with irony, but the irony here is they're saying prophesy as if him not prophesying on demand is proof that they, that their skepticisms are right about Jesus. But he had already prophesied about them in Mark 10, 33. He said, behold, we're going to Jerusalem and the son of man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes and they will condemn him to death and they will hand and will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him. And this is exactly what they're doing, mocking and spitting him, scourge him and kill him. They're going to do these things. So Jesus is actually, he already prophesied about them as they mock him for not being able to prophesy. Um, that's how far off it is. Now, Isaiah 50, 
And this is why today is going to be a long study because we're going to get into a bunch of Isaiah right now. I've been wanting to do this for a while. These are the servant songs of Isaiah. Now, Isaiah 50 <clears throat> verse 6 is a verse that I think is being fulfilled in Jesus' life right now. I gave my back to those who strike me and my cheeks to those who pluck out the beard. I did not cover my face from humiliation and spitting. This is exactly, in fact, because of this, I'm thinking they, they pulled out his beard. They, or at least ripped out parts of it, right? Um, as a way of mocking him. Jesus gave himself over to these things. It is descriptive. It fits. But here's where a lot of people, and understandably, okay, I'm not going to just call you like some sort of mean meanie for doing this. They'll wonder like, hey, Mike. Are you really taking these verses right in the Old Testament or are you getting them out of context? You know, sometimes people go, well, Jesus fulfilled that verse and that verse. And I look at the passage and I go, I don't see how that's about Jesus. Like that verse sounds good, but is that passage really about him? And I can understand some of the problems here. Uh, part of the issue is that the Old Testament is complex and big and you have to study it in detail. Often things you think are out of context that the New Testament authors quote, when you study it more, you find out. It was totally in context. It was just smarter than we thought it was. Well, this is going to be one of those cases. Um, Jesus, to set this up, I'm going to talk about Isaiah and the four servant songs of Isaiah. But to set this up, let me just say, Jesus clearly, I mean, clearly and abundantly in Mark's gospel and the other gospels and later in the New Testament, the other authors as well, they show that Jesus's suffering is connected to Isaiah 53 in particular. Isaiah 53, most of the most of this um, chapter is quoted in the New Testament referring to Jesus. Jesus sees it in this context. When he says his blood's poured out for many, he's he's referring to Isaiah 53. And I've already talked about some of this in detail, so I won't I won't go into it all. But what you may not realize, oh man, I and, and I've been going on for a while. So if you need to take a break, just take a pause. Come back, come back tomorrow, next week, fine. But this is so cool that you get this. Isaiah has four what are called servant songs. Isaiah 53 is the fourth and final of the servant songs. I'm going to look with you at the first three so you can see that these really are talking about Christ and he really is actually fulfilling prophecy given hundreds of years before he was born. So let's look at these servant songs and we'll see how they're about ultimately Jesus. I'm going to do a quick survey of them. The first is in Isaiah 40. Two verses one through four. It's only four verses. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, here it says, Behold my servant, whom I uphold. And, and that's why we call it the servant song. It's a, it's, a, it's a poem and it's about the servant, the servant of Isaiah, who God, earlier in Isaiah, he uses the term servant to talk about different people. But these servant songs are talking about one particular person, Jesus. Um, Behold my servant, whom I uphold whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. Think of the baptism of John. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry out or raise his voice, nor make his voice heard in the street. He won't do it through, through violence. He's not starting a riot. A bruised reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not be disheartened or crushed, until he's established justice in the earth and the coastlands will wait expectantly for his law. Now here it's pretty vague. There's not, I mean, these verses are actually quoted about Jesus in the gospel of John about the bruised reed and all that. Jesus talks about himself like that. Um, <clears throat> but let me just say this, give you some context. You might not notice if you just read this passage by itself. Earlier in Isaiah, Isaiah 40, 41, it's dealing with false idols and it uses this word behold like a key word. It's like behold and describes the false idols. Behold and describes the people worshiping the idols. Then finally, it comes to behold my servant. So in other words, hey Israel, Israel, you got false idols. You got people worshiping false idols. I want you to reject those. The one I want you to look at is my servant, right? That begins the servant songs. He is the one whom we are to follow after. He's not an idol. He's going to be something a lot better than that. So Isaiah 49.1 <clears throat> gives us the second servant song. Listen to me, O islands, and pay attention, you peoples from afar. The Lord called me from the womb. Now this one's in the mouth of the servant. He's the one speaking. The Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother. He named me. Jesus was named before his birth. Uh, he has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he concealed me. He's also made me a select arrow. He's hidden me in his quiver. All this, those three like phrases... 
uh, clauses, these, these are all about Jesus being hidden. The servant is hidden. He's prophesied, but he's not known. This is so consistent with the revelation of Christ he, and the whole Messianic secret theme in Mark. It is. It's like, this was always the plan, but Jesus didn't under, you guys didn't understand it till now. Um, verse 3, he said to me, you are my servant Israel in whom I will show my glory. Now, here's where some and even modern Jews are going to say, Mike, this isn't about Jesus. This isn't about the Messiah. This is about Israel. But remember, he's called Israel, but let's read on because it gets a lot better. <clears throat> um, you'll see why it's not Israel. But I said, I have toiled in vain. I've spent my strength for nothing in vanity. Yet surely the justice due to me is with the Lord and my reward is with my God. So here's one who he's suffering and he's not getting what he deserves, right? He's suffering instead of getting glory and he's trusting himself to God. This is Jesus heading to the cross. Verse five, and now says the Lord who formed me from the womb to be his servant. That's what we call it a servant song to bring back Jacob to him so that Israel might be gathered to him. Check this out. This is, this is the one who's bringing Israel back to God. He's called Israel, but he's bringing Israel back to God. Why is this? This is because, and, and if you guys have been following my content for a while, you know I love typology in the Old Testament. Jesus in the Old Testament. It's one of my favorite subjects. Do you know that typology starts with the Old Testament? Like, this isn't a New Testament thing where we're saying Jesus is the bronze serpent. Jesus is the rock that was struck. Jesus is the greater Moses. Jesus is the great high priest. It's, it's also Old Testament. Here in the servant song, in the second servant song, Jesus is called Israel, but then we find out that he is one who's bringing Israel back to God. So he stands representing all of Israel. Jesus is the greater Israel. He represents all of Israel on the cross, but it's bigger than that <clears throat> because he's not just saving Israel. So he goes on for, I'm honored in the sight of the Lord and my God is my strength. He says, it is too, is it too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and the restored ones? It is too small, uh, of Israel. Uh, the preserved ones of Israel. So the 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 idea of just saving Israel alone, that's too small. I'm also going to make you a light of the nations. Jesus is the light of the world. So that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Do you catch this? This is um this is beautiful. Jesus is the one who's going to save all people. That's 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 what we're getting here in this passage. And then uh, this says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and its holy one, to the despised one, to the one abhorred by the nation. That would be probably the, the Jewish nation. They're going to abhor their own savior. To the servants, the servant of the rulers, kings will see and arise. Princes will also bow down because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. Yeah, you'll be despised, You'll be, but, but eventually they'll all bow before you. Jesus is the name above all names. This is all Old Testament. This is, I don't know if it blows your mind. It was written before, 600 years before Jesus shows up. But we get more and you start to realize these servant songs are, are giving a progressive revelation of who the Messiah is going to be. It climaxes in Isaiah 53, but it builds all the way through. So in Isaiah 50 verses 4 through 10, we have the third servant song. The Lord God has given me the tongue of disciples that I may know how to sustain the weary one with a word. He'll be a teacher. He'll teach God's, God's words to people. He awakens me by morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen as a disciple. <clears throat> the Lord has opened my ear and I was not disobedient, nor did I turn back. John talks about this a lot where Jesus, um, he only does what the father tells him to do. He's following a set plan the whole time. He's walking the earth. He's doing what the father declares. And so he's obedient. He does not turn back. We're watching that right now. When he went to the garden of Gethsemane, he walked forward to be betrayed. He did not turn back. He was obedient even then. And if you think I'm, oh, Mike, you're reading that out of context. No, I'm not. Look, how's he, what's he not turning back from? He gave his back to those who, who strike him. Right? I give my cheeks to those who pluck out the beard. I did not cover my face from humiliation and spitting. And that's the verse that brought us here. Jesus before the, the soldiers of the temple being beaten, being spit upon, being humiliated. He gave himself voluntarily for this. This is 600 years before Christ that we read on. For the Lord God helps me, therefore I'm not disgraced. Therefore I've set my face like flint and I know that I will not be ashamed. Jesus isn't confused. He knows he's going to the cross so he can go and rise from the dead and he can save us all. He also knows he'll be vindicated. Now, the, the resurrection in the New Testament is seen as the vindication of Christ. He's vindicated or proven true by the resurrection. It proves that he was who he claimed. Um, he who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up to each other. Who has a case against me? Remember, nobody had a case against him. Let him draw near to me. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who is he who condemns me? 
right? Uh, that's that's the high priest. That's these guys. They condemn him. But behold, they will all wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them. They're temporary. He's going to reign forever. Who is among you that fears the Lord, that obeys the voice of his servant, that walks in darkness and has no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. And that's how that song ends with this call. Hey, no matter how dark things are, remember, remember the darkness Jesus went through? No matter how dark things are for you, you trust in God. Your vindication will come too. You wait on the Lord. You trust in him. See Jesus on the cross. Know Jesus rises from the dead. You might be going through hard times too, but it's coming. You just trust in him. Beautiful. That just leads us to Isaiah 53, where Jesus has, I'm not going to go through it for the sake of time and because I'll, I'll talk more about it later as we talk about Jesus on the cross in the coming weeks. But Isaiah 52, verse 13 through 53, 12. This is the most detailed theological explanation of the, of the death of Christ for our sins in the entire Bible. And it's, it's not only in Isaiah, the climax of the ultimate you know, purpose of the servant, the servant songs, but throughout Mark and all the gospels, throughout Mark though, clearly Isaiah 53 is the focal point of how we should interpret Jesus on the cross. It's, it's quoted all the time. It's alluded to all the time. Jesus himself starts off alluding to it when he's uh, talking with the disciples. So really beautiful, really powerful. No, these verses aren't brought out of context at all. Um, but I don't want to miss application here. Okay, that's all beautiful theology stuff. Um, I kind of alluded to this already, but let me just bring us to the application. When I see Jesus being hit, being beaten, I don't just have uh, a suffering savior. I've also got an example to follow. And Peter put it this way. Remember the same Peter that couldn't couldn't handle that Jesus was going through this. Later he got it. And he says, for you've been called to the, for this purpose. Since Christ also suffered for, for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, <clears throat> he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. The application for us is pretty simple. Jesus wants us to suffer the way he did, which means giving kindness in exchange for pain and hurt. And I mean, please, Christians, I don't know what suffering you're going through, but there's 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 going to be people that mistreat you today. Respond to them with kindness and grace. Turn the other cheek to them. And it's hard to do this when you look at them and you think you are not deserving of this. But when you look to Jesus and you think that you didn't deserve what he gave you, it gives you... I don't know. I feel like it goes from impossible to turn the other cheek, to turn kindness for, for, for rudeness. But when I look to Jesus, it, it becomes like hard not to like, oh my goodness, the pride and arrogance of me that I wouldn't turn the other cheek. If my savior turned the cheek, how can I not? If my savior was willing to suffer so much, how can I not? All right, let's, let's finish up today by going through the rest of this section, which is just about Peter and his, um, his denials. Mark 14, 66. As Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, see, uh, said you also, excuse me, you also were with Jesus, the Nazarene. But he denied it saying, I neither know nor understand what you were talking about. And he went out onto the porch. So he kind of tries to get away from her. The servant girl saw him and began once more to say to the bystanders, this is one of them. Okay. This is kind of embarrassing, this moment. If you think of Peter, he's he's like running from a servant girl. Like he's fleeing from a servant girl. This is the guy who pulled his sword out and cut off the high priest's ear. He's obviously having some changes in his perspective. He's still trying to follow, trying to get as close as he can. But he does not want to be identified with Christ at this point. Um, it makes sense that they call him someone who's with Jesus the Nazarene because they're not in Nazareth. So calling Jesus the Nazarene is the way that they would talk about Jesus in Jerusalem, especially if they don't they don't believe in him. But it's also embarrassing because it's a servant girl. But but that servant girl, you might think, oh, he ran for a girl. But she's actually kind of embarrassing because she's the servant of the high priest. Like she's not just any old servant girl. She's a servant of the high priest. So that is kind of scary. She is dangerous. She can report to, you know, Peter to the high priest. So he denies it. Then in verse um, 70, but he again denied it. Now he's denying it from the bystanders. And after a little while, the bystanders were again saying to Peter, surely you are one of them for your Galilean too. Now the other gospels reveal to us that the reason why they thought he was Galilean is because of an accent. He had a vocal accent. So Israel's kind of like, uh, say, England, where you have like the London accent and you have a different accent in the north. The different areas in England have different accents. 
or so I have been told. And so they're like this as well. Uh, Galilee has a different way of speaking. They, they just sound different. Um, probably not a flattering thing to have the Galilean accent. And um, in fact, later they, they know they're unlearned men, partly maybe just because of their accents. Um, then in verse 71, we get his response. But he began to curse and swear, I do not know this man you were talking about. Notice what he does. He curses and he swears. Um, this is, uh, we don't want to read this without knowing the history. He's not cussing like the, the F word or something like that. That's not what Peter's doing here. He's probably cursing. This is the word anathema, right? This is, this is like the word for, um, let me be accursed. So he's bringing curses down on either himself or Jesus. It, we don't know for sure. Cause it's, it's vague. The text doesn't tell us what he, he was cursing. He may have been cursing him, himself. Maybe Jesus, maybe both saying something like, um, God do so and such and such to me or worse if I'm not telling the truth right now. So he's promising, he's swearing, he's making an oath, but he's also accompanying it with a curse. God strike me down. God make me suffer if I'm not telling the truth. This, this is the low point for Peter. He said, Jesus, I, I will die with you. But now in the, in the name of God, probably, or something like that, he, he denies him. <clears throat> and he asks for curses to be brought down upon him. Now, I don't know if you were Peter. I don't know if you might be thinking, oh, God can never forgive me now. Like he can never forgive me for that. Jesus said, if, I, if, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my father in heaven. And I denied him before men. This is exactly what I did. But it turns out that Peter was forgiven. That this whole deny me before men isn't if you ever do it once. It's if this is the choice you make and you stick to it. But if at any point you turn, you repent, you turn from that, you can be restored. I think that this is an example of how major, major lapses and failures are forgivable, are forgivable in Christ. Those who think, oh, I've done too much. I went too far. God can't forgive me. That's just not true. Um, and I think God picked Peter and Paul, uh, David. I think he picked these people partly because they failed so big, right? Paul was persecuting and trying to murder Christians. Um, Peter denied Christ. Uh, David committed adultery and murder. I, I think these people are partly picked so that we can have hope in the grace of God that he can still use us even though we've majorly failed. Then we get the very last verse we're covering today. Immediately rooster crowed a second time and Peter remembered how Jesus had made the remark to him before a rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he began to weep. He began to weep. This is the low point for Peter. Um, He's kind of lost everything. He's scared. He's terrified of dying. Um, oh, I didn't put it on the screen there for you. He's terrified of dying though. And <clears throat> just compare this to the Peter we get later on, who in second Peter tells us soon I'll be putting off my tent as the Lord showed me. He knew he was heading to a painful death and he's like, you know, I wish I could stick around just to help you guys. Like, but he's enjoying the idea of going to glory. This is so different. Like when you see, see, this is him seeing the death of Christ, but not the resurrection of Christ. When he sees the resurrection of Christ, he's then willing to put off his own tent and follow Jesus. We got to be like that. You got to be like that. So Peter, um, Peter's, Peter's not such a, such a terrible loser. He's just kind of like you and me. <laughs> we, we, we kind of need, need his example. Um, so the, um, the, in conclusion, the, me the messianic secret stuff in Mark's gospel, I think hopefully I've showed through the careful theology that Jesus is giving us in this gospel, not just Mark, Jesus is giving us that we have a Messiah who is not a mere social deliverer, but he's divine, right? He's the son of God. He's the one who says, I am right with all this like tension in his voice. And he is also the one who will suffer and die for our sins in our place. He is, he is giving us the central beliefs of Christian faith. They're coming straight from Christ. The disciples talk about them later, but they come from Christ. So this is the theology of the gospel right here in the gospel of Mark. Um, beautiful stuff. So we're going to pray, but before we do that, uh, next week, <clears throat> next week, um, I'm going to be uh, digging into uh, Pilate and Barabbas, Jesus before Pilate, the whole issue of Barabbas, that kind of thing. So it's going to be getting really, really neat, really neat stuff. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. And I hope y'all will stick with me. Um, I know. I'm doing long studies, but I can't help it. Like I study all week and I have all the stuff to share with you. You should see all the stuff I cut out. <laughs> Let's pray. Um, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the example that we have in Jesus and even the example of restoration from failure that we have in Peter, as well as the warning about our own 
attitude towards suffering. I mean, so much of the Bible seems to be trying to just teach us to have a different attitude towards suffering than, we, than we've got. Help us to do that. Help us to look to Jesus, not only his death, but his resurrection so that we could see the goodness in all of it. We pray for your glory in our lives. We pray, Lord, that even today you would help us right now today to be very deliberate and purposeful about returning kindness for those who are, who hurt us, who are cruel to us, who spitefully use us to bless them, to, to love them, to pray for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, y'all. Uh, thanks for joining me. Really blessed for those of you guys that come. And um, <clears throat> this wouldn't happen without the support. I'm not even, I'm not asking for support. I'm just saying thank you for those of you who have been supporting this ministry. That's such a huge uh, thing like literally we're, we're getting, I mean, at least 50,000 people a day that are watching videos right now. And it's all free content that's out there. And I'm able to do it because, and, and continue putting everything out free because of the support. And I'm just, um, and we're, we're supported. We're well supported. So I'm not even asking for more. I'm just saying, thank you for those who've been taking care of us. That's, you know, really neat, really neat. You're partners in, in this ministry. And, uh, I guess that's all I got to say. So <laughs> Take care. See you guys on Friday.